So kia ora tato. Um, I'm actually employed by Statistics New Zealand currently on secondment with the Children's Action Plan. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my kind of journey measuring data and, um, and now trying to put it to use. And the, uh, the motto you see up on the board there, unleashing the power of data, is Statistics New Zealand's current sort of corporate mission. And I think what's really important there is, is the idea that data has value, but it has to be realised and it has to be put to work. And if I was going to change that in any way, I would, I would add for the better to change lives, because I think we need to improve people's lives with data. Now, we, we collect data for a number of reasons, and um, one of the really important things we do is um, we look at structural drivers of change. New Zealand has an ageing population, and the younger cohort coming through, there's more ethnic diversity, there's, there's changes in the way the workforce is structured that has implications for people who design and deliver our services. We measure outcomes, and we are particularly interested in persistent poor outcomes, people who are trapped in poverty. The important outcomes around education, health, um, material well-being, social cohesion, these are all the sort of crucial things that we need to understand. We need to understand how those things are distributed across the population. We know that Māori have, um, still have poor outcomes compared to New Zealand Europeans, and that, that's even adjusting for age with the younger population, older population. We know that there's a really powerful regional narrative in New Zealand of decline in some areas and, and expansion in others. I think Gisborne has the, uh, one of the highest birth rates in New Zealand and the population is declining. And that's because people leave to find work in other areas and that creates housing, um, heat and housing markets in places like Auckland. And actually it may, means that some people get stuck and there isn't the working age population to deliver the services. Really importantly, I think, and, and for people such as yourselves, and I think for the government at the moment, it's about understanding pathways, tr transitions, and cause and effect. We know that childhood abuse um, will have huge ramifications through the, through the life trajectory of the child. The really important question there is, what response is possible by society and the government, and how do we know those responses are the right ones? So one of, the, um, one of the areas that I've been working in um, recently is in the measurement of social wellbeing and, and multidimensional wellbeing. And that's been articulated um, by Stiglitz and Sen and Fatusi in their report to the uh, European Commission, where they talked about the, um, the compound effect of disadvantage. So having, having poor outcomes in health or income or another aspect of your life is more than three times the single, single effect. And very importantly, that Nothing exists in isolation, everything is interrelated. So I think this sits at the heart of thinking around vulnerability and it sits uh, at the heart of thinking around multiple disadvantage. This uh, graph here is from the New Zealand Disability Survey and it's showing you um, the distribution of housing problems for Māori, just for Māori, by disability status. And the first thing you can see is pretty straightforward. Māori with disabilities have poor housing outcomes compared to Māori without disability. So that throws up some questions. Um, obviously, housing is linked to health. Health can, can exacerbate disability. And to the degree that there might be discrimination in the housing market, Māori or disabled people might actually struggle to, um, to get decent housing. So I think the really important thing about this is if you're going to actually understand this and do something about it, where are the drivers? What are the levers? What are the, what's the really important thing to work with? And maybe that actually housing is an easier thing to change than disability status or not. We did some work um, with some people across government. We sat down with people from Superu, MSD, Statistics New Zealand. People have been working in this area for a very, very long time and we did this exercise for causal link mapping using the social report indicators. Now the really interesting thing about this is, even though these people were quite senior, been working in this area for a long time, there was really diverse um, perspectives on what's linked to what and how, and I think we bring a lot of theory and a lot of assumption to this. So the green lines you can see in that, um, in that diagram are the ones where there was agreement, and the blue lines are where actually people disagreed. And I've got to say to you, this is the simplified version, the, the actual total picture of this. 
people said to us, what am I going to do with that? And we said, well, actually, life is really complicated and there is no one common view of it, you know. So this is a sort of a simplified one, but what you can see with this is actually you can see that a lot of arrows start with employment or they start with material deprivation and a whole lot of arrows lead to things like overall life satisfaction or overall health status. And actually, if, you, if you're taking a systemic approach to this, you might be looking at this and thinking, what in this would I really want to measure? And if I was going to do some interventions, how would I intervene in one area to actually um, produce a change in another? And I think really importantly for Aotearoa New Zealand is the ability to express identity down in the bottom right corner where there's quite a lot of activity around. Ability to express who you are and what you are is actually really, really important. So because the real picture looks actually so complicated, whoop, um, we use simplified versions of the world. We call these uh, conceptual frameworks, conceptual maps of the world. This is the OECD Wellbeing Conceptual Framework, and it's kind of a parent framework to a whole lot of measurement activities in New Zealand at the moment. And what it kind of shows you is that there's material, there's material conditions and GDP and economic activity. There's what we call the quality of life domains, and they include you know, your health status, your work-life balance, personal security. And I think alongside GDP is what's called regrettables, which my understanding of regrettables is the money that goes on prisons and crime and, and hospital care when actually it could have been um, diverted into, into proactive approaches. And sitting underneath that, sustainability, which is actually the, uh, the four capitals. And this thinking is sort of evident in the Treasury's living standards approach, and it's evident in most economic theory, and it sits behind a lot of um, the monitoring uh, frameworks that are being used at the moment. So I think the, um, the really important thing is if you're going to measure stuff, you need to start with a really good picture of what you think the world looks like and then figure out which bits of this do I really, really need to capture. And conceptual frameworks are a really important part of that. So uh, accommodating preference throwing my pages have stuck together. There we go. Um, so a really important uh, driver behind this sort of understanding around well-being is that everybody has a different view of how they would like to live their, their life, and that's okay within certain parameters. So it's the ability to exercise choice to live the life that you yourself most value that is, is the key part of your well-being. So there are cultural contexts to this, and there are different appetites for things. Some people might want to be artists and live with low money. Other people making a lot of money is, is important. When we apply well-being measurement, we start from the sort of fundamental approach. There is no size seven shoe. But if we measure the degree to which the person themselves thinks that their life is valuable and useful to them, that gives us a common denominator across the, uh, across the complexity of their life. So we did um, a couple of surveys. We did the New Zealand General Social Survey across the total population. And we did Te Kupinga, which we developed uh, for, the, for Māori in New Zealand. And when we did Te Kupinga, we took that OECD framework as a starting point and we added in Te Ao Māori, which is connection to traditional, uh, traditional identity and, and traditional sense of place. And we got these two data sets in. The first analysis was, we did was on the New Zealand General Social Survey and we did regression models to see what are the things that really drive life satisfaction for people in New Zealand. And we found that in common with most Western countries, health is the most powerful determinant of well-being for most people. Without your health, life satisfaction erodes pretty quick. Sitting behind that is, is relationships as evidenced by freedom from loneliness. And sitting alongside and slightly adjacent to relationships is adequacy of income. So, our view was actually you need those three things to, to, to value your life as a, as a person in New Zealand. When we got the Te Kupinga data set, we repeated that analysis and we found it was quite a surprise and we repeated the analysis several times to make sure it wasn't a, an error. That actually for Māori relationships is a more powerful driver of well-being than health and I think that has quite profound um, implications for the way people design and deliver services to Māori in New Zealand and, and obviously people who have been involved in whana ora would say to me that's no surprise whatsoever but the thing about this work I think is that it provides a sort of an evidence base that you do need to consider cultural paradigms and different ways of approaching things when you're working with different populations. 
So um, when they were developing the white paper on vulnerable children in New Zealand, we did some uh, work on the GSS data and we looked at combinations of risk factors. We worked with MSD to identify what, what they believed were some, some risk factors for children and, and there was a whole lot of things about the, the parents or caregivers in the house having been a victim of crime or having a mental health issue or living in persistent material deprivation. We, we developed about nine risk factors and we did an analysis of, of the children from the General Social Survey data set and we found that actually for children, 6% of New Zealand children are living in, in what we call high risk households and that means there's five plus risk factors. 19%, um, that's one in five, are living in households with three to four risk factors. And if you look at that, that's a quarter of New Zealand children in, the, in those top two categories. So I think for us in particular, and I think for, your, for yourselves as well, the question becomes, well, what are you going to do about that? And that's sort of part of why I'm now working with the Children's Action Plan, because my mission, I suppose, is to take some of this data and apply it to uh, real world problems. And the Children's Action Plan is, is uh, basically built on this premise that no single agency or intervention can actually address the, the issues for vulnerable children. And that there's a very uh, powerful sort of principle about sharing information, working together, and providing um, joined up transdisciplinary responses to complex problems. I think the thing about this sort of approach too, and, and as it gathers currency, and I think the Productivity uh, Commission report is, is pointing, pointing quite squarely in that way, it's an investment approach to social service delivery that's, that's going to actually have the traction as we move forward. So there's probably never been a better time in New Zealand to use data to inform social services. This is the um, integrated data infrastructure that Statistics New Zealand is putting together at the moment. We're taking all of the government data, or as much as they can get their hands on, and linking it at person level. It's an anonymised data set. And we're linking in the survey data, so you can see census is in there, the New Zealand General Social Survey will be in there. And actually, it's going to give a huge capacity to measure those transitions, pathways, and um, causes and effects that, that I spoke of at the beginning. But like any data set, it's only as valuable as it is used, and it's only really as useful as it is applied to improving the lives of New Zealanders. So I think the, um, the thing is, this data set is available for, for research now, but that causal link diagram I showed you before, life is really, really complicated. And this data set is quite complicated as well. So it's going to take actually the evolution of the, of the right skill sets to approach this data set. Really importantly is the right questions. And we could take an approach with the Children's Action Plan where we monitor a cohort through this. You can look back 20 years, you can look forward indefinitely. There is a whole lot of options at the moment to actually use this data. So I think you know we've got this well-being measurement that really gives us a sense about what matters to people, and the and the, the caveat on that is we need to make what matters count in policy dialogues and discourse. We've got things like the IDI that are just opening frontiers up for actually uh, measuring data, and we've got the data that you yourselves are collecting and using, and actually that's very powerful as well because alongside that data is the knowledge about what it means. So I suppose in this sense, if we're going to um, unleash the power of data, we can only really do that together. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. Am I on this time? Yes. Hey. We have time for one or two questions. Fantastic. There's our roving mic. Here, please, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Oh, kia ora. Um, thanks very much. I really admire the work that Stats does. It's um, really affirming. I just would like you to talk about. You think that the investment approach is the way to go, and I've just read a paper by the CTU that undermines that. Could you just tell me what you mean by an investment approach? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I've worked in mental health services and I've worked actually with Stephanie, who I see in the front row, kia ora, um, with homeless in, in Wellington. And often when you're dealing with people whose lives have evolved over a period of time, and they started with unfortunate childhood experiences, you sort of ask yourself, actually, if the right interventions were in place 10 or 15 years ago, 
would what I am doing now be easier? And maybe, maybe not. But I think actually what you what you need to do as a society, I'm talking societal level, is at least try and get and get in actually with timely, effective interventions as early as possible. Yep. Yeah, I think primary health care is an investment approach, really, isn't it? You know, I mean, the terminology may not be right, but I think you know, um, with limited opportunities and and finite budgets, we we need to actually make the very best out of what we have. Yeah.